It was a beautiful fall day, pretty warm, early season. It was the beginning of the rifle season in the first week. The elk were moving through the sagebrush down below us. I definitely took a lot of time to calm myself, to breathe, and to be sure that the shot was going to be a good one. I remember that hunt. I remember that animal. I know how that animal died. I was there and I took responsibility for that and I took that animal apart and I will waste nothing. Removing that, that hide from the animal, seeing how it's all put together and then working it through this process to turn it into something that you want to make clothing out of. It's, it, to me, it's just magical. It's this unique connection to the animals that you are hunting. And then history. I am hosing off the residual salt. It's like gorilla hide tanning. Here we are, <laughs> hose it off in the alley. And, oh, I think I'm gonna, well, I guess they can go in here. Doesn't really matter who goes in what bucket. And yeah, I mean, they're a little hydrophobic right now, so they won't sink very well. So I encourage them. After they come out of the water tomorrow, I'm going to put them into a really, really light basic solution. Hides that are very dehydrated will not rehydrate well in that solution, so it's important that you put them in water to rehydrate them before they go into that solution. Stirring is important because you'll have parts of the hide in contact with other parts of the hide and it won't get hydrated in the way that you want it to. So the more you stir it, the better the process works. The buck helps to significantly reduce the bacterial load of a hide. So moving forward through the process, that hide is less likely to cause you an infection or cause you problems. And when it goes into the brains, it's not bringing that bacteria with it. The solution that I use is probably about 25 gallons of water. The trash can's about 30 gallons to, to the top. So 25 to 30 gallons of water and one cup of concentrated potassium hydroxide. You want to be really careful with this stuff. I wear gloves when I work with it. Potassium hydroxide in its concentrated form is incredibly caustic and it will burn your skin, it will burn your eyes. You do not want to breathe the dust. So I just hold my breath, scoop it out of the container, put it into the water. Once it's in the water, it's fine. And I stir it in, I have a very light basic solution at that point. And I'm trying to shift the pH of the hide towards basic using this solution. So I put my hides in the buck for about 24 hours. Ease them over the edge and into the solution. And once they're in there, get them down in. Do not overbuck your hides. If your solution is too strong or your hides hang out in there too long, you run the risk of causing yourself problems. If you overbuck your hide, the hair will eventually fall out and then you don't have a good guide for how to get around a hide because belly hair is white, so you know when you're getting to thinner areas. The hide ends up super rubbery and the grain really just won't come off. It is much more important to have a well hydrated grain layer than it is to buck a hide. Grain is an important term I will talk about a lot 
the grain is actually on the hair side and the hair side has a top dermal layer that the follicles sit in and that is what I'm talking about when I'm talking about grain. After 24 hours in the buck, I'll pull the hides out and I will begin graining. So I put them on the beam. A bucked hide is super slippery on PVC. I will take a little piece uh, of just some piece of old towel and I work that under my hide, between the hide and the beam, and that keeps it in place. I'll work just, just one arm's length out and I like that for students because if you're new to hide tanning, you get a feel for how, how the grain's gonna move. You can, in that area, you're like, you get a sense of what you're doing, how much pressure you need to put, and you'll work like a rectangle of the hide moving towards the tail. You'll turn the hide, you'll work out towards the edges, towards the belly or the front legs, turn it the other way, do the same thing. And at that point, it's really important that you work the neck. So I turn the whole hide around and I work the neck. You're working against the grain, but the neck's gonna be the hardest. For that reason, you're working against the way it really wants to come off. But the best way to do it is when you have some weight on the back end of the hide with the rest of the hair on there so that it doesn't try to just run away from you down the beam. And if you save the neck till last, it's the hardest. You will not have the energy to do a good job. So do the neck first. You will spend most of your time there and it's exhausting. And then when you are done with that and you flip it around and get into the rest of the hide, it's much easier. And you will be surprised by how easy the rest of it is and how well it flows. So that's the system that I use. Um, do that center line, turn it, do the neck, turn it again and get into the rest of the hide. You wanna be really mindful to, to vary how much pressure you're putting on the hide. Um, belly is really thin, don't put holes in things. You can, you can be more aggressive with the neck, the spine line, the haunches, things like that. So if you're familiar with kind of the topography of a deer, you can be very efficient with how you, how you use your energy. If you've worked the whole hide and you've taken all the grain off, you won't know if you've missed a little subgrain or not because um, you've, you've laid it all flat just through the pressure of running the tool over the hide. So, you have to rehydrate your hide then. You need to get the pH back to normal to be able to take it through the rest of the process anyway. So I put that in fresh water, multiple rinses of fresh water, stir them frequently and change out the water and that brings the pH back to normal. And usually if I do that and I'm consistent with stirring and I'm consistent with changing washes, then by the next morning it's ready to go. After the pH is back to normal, the hide is really well hydrated and I can see all of the little grain islands, I can see the subgrain, which takes an eye. Like grain islands stand out, they're shiny, they're raised up, you know when you see one of those. Subgrain can be more subtle. So I'll put the hide on the beam, I'll basically work it the exact same way and I'm doing touch up at this point. I'm gonna be really targeted in the areas that require it. So if I see grain, if I see subgrain, I'm gonna be sure that I get those areas to get that off of there. And then I'm going to generally hit the rest of the hide. And you'll be amazed how much stuff you take off. It's pretty surprising. Once I've done the whole hide and I've done the, the grain side and done touch up, I flip it over and I remembrane the hide. So I got a lot of membrane off when I was fleshing, but there's a layer of membrane on there that doesn't come off very well because the cushion of the hair when you're fleshing between you and the beam doesn't really allow you to get enough purchase to remove that. So at this point you can, and you go back over, work the hide the same way in terms of the workflow and remove that membrane layer. And your hide will look really clean at that point. The other thing that you're doing through both of those, you're doing touch up, you're doing membraning, and you're dehydrating the hide. You're moving water out of it. And you can see all that moisture getting pushed out of the hide. That hide is now a wrung out sponge so that when it goes into the next step, which is braining for brain tan buckskin, when it goes into the brain solution, uh, it's thirsty and it will soak those brains up. If it went in fully hydrated and wet, your first braining wouldn't do anything. So again, you're setting yourself up for success with the next step and it's a more efficient use of the process. At any point along the way though, for me, which is why this works really well, I can just put them in the freezer. So I have a chest freezer that's just for hides. 
when they go into storage until the next step, I like to label what they are. And then when I brain them, uh, after braining, they'll go back in the same bag. So again, I can select for the size and thickness of the hide. So when I soften them, I know what I'm getting into. I feel increasingly connected to the hides as I work through the process because I'm spending more time with that hide. I get to know the animal, their story, their scars more intimately as the process goes along. I just get more and more excited about what these hides are going to be. I really come at it from the craft and artistry side of it. You know, you see buckskin in movies or you see buckskin in museums and you see these like beautiful works of art. I want to make hides that are as beautiful as possible and as perfect as I can make them so that the people who receive them really know that I, I, I put everything I had into making that as good as I could make it. And I am so glad that I'm at a point in my own learning process that I can now teach this and help people to, to find success. Ready to step into this craziness? I sure am. I love watching people go through the process because it's hard. It's hard work. And this is the thing that I fell in love with. It's what I have pursued for the last, I guess, at least a decade now, probably longer. Cool. We're gonna call that guy good. For reasons maybe I don't even fully understand, like I wanted to perfect this skill to the best of my abilities because I just absolutely fell in love with the process.